Balloons have served as the observer's high ground since Napoleon's time. Balloon ships, lofting observers, could spot the enemy fleet better than even the tallest crow's nest. The independently powered airship was the ultimate observation post. When radar sets became small enough for aircraft, the blimp offered a stable, long-endurance sensor platform. M3 proved an airship could act as a radar station, combat information center, and command post. When the Soviet bloc threatened to use long-range bombers, America's coast needed standoff radar coverage. The proven ZPG-2 design was modified by removing the anti-submarine gear and installing the powerful new APS-20E search radar. A second height finder radar, the AP-62, was installed on top of the envelope. The first ZPG-2W was rolled out from Goodyear Aircraft Air Dock in January of 1955. An entirely new squadron, ZW-1, was commissioned January 3, 1956 under Commander Larry Mack. Following many test flights and operational demonstrations, the second ZPG-2W was delivered to Lakehurst in December of 1955. Two more ZPG-2Ws were delivered to the squadron later that year. In concert with distant early warning stations and radar platforms mounted on offshore platforms, ZW-1 became part of the ADIS, or an Air Defense Identification Zone, under NORAD. Flying typical missions of 36 hours or more, the ZPG-2Ws flew radar barrier patrols hundreds of miles out to sea. Ever vigilant for Russian bombers, the airships monitored air traffic and vectored fighters to investigate any aircraft that strayed from its flight plan and did not answer challenges. Technicians could reach the height finder radar atop the envelope by climbing a long ladder enclosed in a sleeve inside the helium envelope. A view from the top was a memorable experience. As barrier operations became routine, the bag refueling method was perfected to be independent of the fleet. Airplanes dropped fuel bags by parachute, where they floated until the airship drug its special fish across the bag line and hauled the gasoline aboard. Helicopters would have burned more energy than the 900-pound bag contained. In one exercise, airshipmen were challenged to maintain a continuous radar patrol 200 miles off the coast of New Jersey for 10 days and nights during the worst weather the area had experienced in 35 years. So-called all-weather military planes and commercial aircraft were grounded. But the airships kept going and continued their patrol through fog, sub-zero temperatures, high surface winds, freezing rain, snow, sleet, and icing. Following another long routine patrol, a ZPG-2W was returning home when a violent storm and high winds made it impossible to make headway towards Lakers. Command pilot, Lieutenant George Allen and his crew, low on fuel, rode the storm out to Bermuda and landed safely at Kinley Air Force Base. In another test, the airship's radar had successfully tracked a ship-launched Regulus guided missile. The most advanced radar aloft was just what the fleet needed, and exercises with Carrier Division 16 and 18 proved the concept. But not all officers agreed and the airships were never encouraged to work as radar scouts for the fleet. Larger radar antennas at still higher altitudes would offer the ultimate observation technology. 
So the last DPG-2W airship to be built was fitted with the powerful new APS-70 radar, which removed the car's radome and featured a spinning antenna inside the helium envelope. These lessons were applied to design the ZPG-3W, the most sophisticated radar picket yet constructed. Emerging from the air dock for its first flight in July 1958, the largest pressure airship ever built displaced one and a half million cubic feet the most capable mooring mast since the days of the rigids, the Type 5, could anchor and power the 3W and was adjustable for the earlier ships. Its powerful APS-70 radar featured an even larger 40-foot wide antenna mounted inside the helium envelope. The proven APS-62 radar mounted atop the envelope fed separate scopes in the car for target height finding. The ZPG-3W design returned the engines to the outriggers for greater interior space and a quieter car. The second deck featured a galley and dinette where one member of the crew would double as a cook. The relief crew could get some sack time in the bunks above the flight deck. Most powerful engines ever mounted on an airship, the Wright R1820s, could develop more than 1,500 horsepower. 3W number 242's first barrier patrol under command pilot Lieutenant Commander Richard Riddicombe held patrol station for almost 50 hours, 50% 50 longer than the average 2W mission. One ZPG 3W was pressed into service to stand in for failed Washington DC area ground radars. During the 40-hour mission, the airship's radar could see airplanes invisible to ground sensors. Two more ZPG-3W airships were delivered in 1959, when retirees Admiral Carl Lang and veteran designer Dr. Carl Arnstein came along to deliver ZPG-3W number 297 in April of 1960 Everyone hoped it would not be the last Navy airship. But a proposed anti-submarine version of the 3W was not approved. The 3W held great promise for making operational flights with record-breaking performance. Since the airship could fly in all weather, more effort was invested in cold weather ground handling. A water cannon mounted on an old mooring mast gave way to another ice removal system mounted on one side of the Type 5 mast. Sadly, the 3W was destined for more than its share of bad luck. At Weymouth Naval Air Station, an ill wind blows no good to the world's largest blimp, the remains of which lie strewn on the tarmac after a gust of wind hurled a huge gas bag against the hangar as it was being burst. The bill for damages may run as high as $12 million, hard cash for the lighter-than-aircraft. Just picking up the pieces is an enormous task. However, none of the crew was injured when the deflated bag collapsed. Good news, despite that ill wind. Some airship men were concerned about the two-ton radar package sitting atop the envelope. During a Lakehurst Air Show demonstration, a ZPG-3W's pressure was inadvertently allowed to drop and the envelope sagged harmlessly during one thrilling pass. On the 6th of July, 1960, ZPG-3W number 144242 departed Lakehurst for a routine patrol mission. Later, people in boats noticed a sag in the envelope just before the airship suddenly plunged into the Atlantic. The car sank so rapidly, 18 of the 21 on board were drowned. Divers found the low pressure warning system circuit breakers were open, and one explanation blames this mistake for the crew not being aware of low envelope pressure. Others point out the airship could not have been deliberately flown into the water, 
with such fatal force and insist the cotton envelope burst in the air, causing the crash. Goodyear's envelope, the same one extensively fail-tested but put into service anyway, was carefully examined but could not be completely absolved of fault. A lawsuit filed on behalf of those killed was not resolved until November 1968. Radar picket work was equally deadly to the Air Force, which maintained radar stations on distant offshore platform structures called Texas Towers. On the 15th of January 1961, Texas Tower 4, hit by a horrific storm, collapsed in the ocean, killing 28 men. But for the Navy radar ships, the 3W crash was the last straw. Dick Whittacombe commanded ZPG 3W number 297, fitted with an improved Dacron envelope in the final 3W flight on the 22nd of May, 1961. Senior officers decided it was more logical to employ four Super Constellation airplanes in rotation, burning many times more fuel, to do the work of one 3W blimp. The nation's attention turned to the space race. Airship duties that included missile test range work at Wallops Island, Virginia. The blimps also shadowing the Russian trawlers monitoring the test launches. A plan to use airships to recover nose cones was canceled. It became just another mission for which airships would no longer be available. All fleet airship activity was ordered stopped on the 30th of June, 1961. The second Mercury Redstone flight nearly ended tragically when the Navy Carrier Recovery Group lost the Mercury capsule and nearly drowned Gus Grissom. Retired Admirals Rosendahl and Settle publicly blasted the Navy for not using an inexpensive single airship that would not have botched the job. The official rebuttal claimed the Navy airships were needed elsewhere for other duties. The single ZSG-1 airship, still flying, had been modified to support a new mission. Physical limitations of wind tunnels to make it impractical to test subjects at low airspeed. The 240 was heavily instrumented and equipped with a retractable boom that could be extended from the envelope and car. Test models mounted on the boom could be observed without wind tunnel wall effect. When the larger ZPG-2559 became available for the project, the envelope and radar dome was modified to accept larger, active models on a longer, deployable boom. A variety of models were tested beneath the 559. Longer missions were conducted to gather data on short takeoff and landing aircraft, then on the drawing boards. Higher speed runs were scheduled first to burn off fuel weight and restore equilibrium. Then the airship's ability to fly slowly or even backwards allowed Princeton University researchers to gather data not obtainable by any other method. Even the ZS-2G-1 could not operate its towed sonar at speeds reached by the new nuke subs, allowing the submarine to escape the track. 240 received special streamlining and began a series of secret tests to decrease drag and exercise control of its boundary layer. Engineering was completed on a stern propulsion unit that, like its submarine adversary, would take advantage of the reduced pressure at the stern. There was even a plan to fit the larger engines from a 3W on a smaller ship. Before that, or another season of flying wind tunnel tests could be carried out, the Navy ordered all airship operations halted. The Navy posted no notice and no official movie cameramen were sent. But the word was quietly passed there would be one final blimp flight. The 31st of August, 1962, offered clear weather over the Navy's only active airship station. 
Hundreds of supporters reported N.A.'s Lakers for the last flight of a Navy airship that century. ZPG-2, number 144559, took aboard a number of senior guest officers, including retired Admiral Charles Rosendahl. As hundreds of families watched, a working crew detached the ship from the mast and it lifted off at 1,400 hours. Under command pilot, Commander Bob Shannon, the airship overflew the local area and landed at 1536. The extendable Type 5 mooring mast was brought up for the final time. As supporters eagerly grabbed the handling lines to wrestle the airship into historic Hangar 1, some still held hope the airship program would get another extension. It never came. By October of 1962, the Cuban Missile Crisis would reveal America suddenly had no greatly persistent aircraft capability. The Soviets maneuvered four Foxtrot-class submarines armed with nuclear-tipped torpedoes around the U.S. fleet as Russian missile submarines were staged in Cuban waters. As the airships were disassembled and stored, that crisis would become just another of many in which America no longer had airships for its defense. Forty-five years of buoyant flight in U.S. naval service came to an end. Not with a bang, but with a whimper. <laughs>